Okay, the title of my paper is uh, Marx's, with a bit of a change, Marx's particular species being <laughs> and the universality of the Palestinian struggle. It is something that I've been uh, trying to revise and work on in sort of dialogue and debate with uh, the Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek, uh, going back to Hegel and Marx. And um, this paper is, is um, a reflection of some of the um, parts of the project that I'm, I'm working on in, in, um, in that area. So in his recent book, Like a Thief in Broad Daylight, Power in the Era of Post-Humanity, the Slovenian philosopher Slavo Žižak writes, concrete universality means that there is no abstract universality of rules, there are no typical situations, all we are dealing with is exceptions. However, a concrete totality is the totality that regulates the concrete context of exceptions. We should thus, on account of our fidelity to concrete analysis, reject any form of nominalism. To the nominalist claim that there is no pure, neutral universality, that every universality is caught up in the conflict of particular ways of life, one should reply, no, today it's the particular ways of life that do not exist as autonomous modes of historical existence. The only actual reality is that of the universal capitalist system. <coughs> this is why in contrast to identity politics, Slavoj adds, uh, which focuses on how each ethnic, religious, sexual group should be able fully to assert its particular identity, the much more difficult and radical task is to enable each group to, accept, to access full universality. This access to universality does not mean a recognition that one is also part of the universal human genus or the assertion of some ideological values that are considered universal. Rather, it means recognizing one's own universality, the way it is at work in the fractures of one's particular identity, as the work of the negative that undermines every such identity. For Zizek, the struggle for ra racial justice must be grounded in a dialectical materialist understanding of the gap between the particular and the universal, which not only destabilizes identity within them, but also serves as the foundation for a true universality. Zizek's crucial point here is that identities should be taken up on the promise of actualizing this eminent universal dimension that was opened up precisely through the brutal history of genocide, slavery, colonialism, internment, apartheid, etc. Briefly, Zizek maintains that every identity is split from within and is coincident with a gap that exists eminently at its core. That is, this gap or destabilizing excess at the core of every identity serves as the common denominator or universal dimension, the transcultural link, as he says elsewhere, that cuts across all identities and cultures. Universality in this sense cannot be obtained by ascending higher up to any abstract notion of common humanity or the family of man, but by going deeper down into the gaps and inconsistencies at the core of the individual and culture. However, identities which are misrecognized as self-enclosed and substantial are prone to repressing this universal dimension. Zizek draws on Hegel's thought to develop this notion of concrete universality. In Hegel, the universal coincides with the particular contents or concrete situations through which it can be hegemonized while at the same time maintaining its universal frame in and through these concrete situations. Zizek thus maintains that for Hegel, the particular content is not only a subspecies of the universality of the total process, it also hegemonizes it, this very universality. Transmute, transmuting universality itself into a part of, or rather drawn into, the particular content. As such, the universal does not stand in opposition to some concrete content or particular <laughs> feature of the totality. Rather, both universal and particular occupy the same paradoxical zone of indistinction. In order to sustain itself, therefore, 
Hegelian universality requires a point of inherent exclusion, an exception at which it is suspended. For Hegel, therefore, universality is inherently exclusive, not only in the simple sense of excluding the underprivileged other, but more importantly, as Jesus says, in the sense of excluding its own permanent founding gesture, a set of unwritten and acknowledged rules and practices, which while publicly disavowed, are nonetheless the ultimate support of the existing power edifice. Um, to this extent, concrete universality refers to the exception that is reconciled in the universal. That is, concrete universality is formed through the unity of the abstract universal with its constitutive exception. Unsurprisingly, Zizek considers such points of exception to be constitutive of the very side of political universality. Um, okay, now Zizek grounds this, as I've been saying, this analysis of the concrete universal in Hegelian thought. But it's also possible to see an equivalent to this notion in Marx's idea of particular species being. I haven't really given this much thought because I've been working with Zizek and Hegel most of the time, but since Sammy invited me to, to come and, and, and share my thoughts on this issue with you, I have been researching this issue in Marx and um, what I've been reading in the Grundrisse, for example, uh, lend itself to the same sort of analysis. So in the Grundrisse, Mar Marx argues that every universality is colored by a particular content and he distinguishes between two types of universality. But um, so, well, one of the examples that he gives about this is the issue of labor. He says that, um, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, labor seems quite a simple category and it seems to be a transhistorical universal. Um, he says prehistoric hunters labor just as computer program, oh well, that's the commentator, ju uh, just as computer programmers do. So it is with labor, which is why it is not until Smith in his analysis, reflecting on bourgeois society, that the category of labor achieves its fullest abstraction and generality. With the category of labor, we reach the abstract universality of wealth creating activity, not tied to any one particular activity. Marx's argument is that this abstract category of general labor could only be developed within bourgeois society because it was only there that labor had in reality become general. In bourgeois society, no one form of labor predominates such that individuals can with ease transfer from one labor to another. And where the specific kind of labor is a matter of chance for them, hence of indifference, unquote. Um, so under, under capitalism, the abstraction of the category labor, labor as such, labor pure and simple, becomes true in practice because it becomes abstract in reality. The abstract category of labor is thus based on what labor, uh, later Marxist critics call a real abstraction an abstraction that is located in material practices and actions rather than in our minds, and which is then reflected in the categories of thought. And again, this is all a part of a debate. I will talk about this later in, in the method that um, Marx develops in his critique of, of Hegel and the Grundrisse. Um, in, in her article on uh, this issue, uh, Charlotte uh, Bonham makes a very concise point and analyzes the different manifestations of uh, this analysis of labor in, uh, in, in Marx. And I'm going to use um, a long quote from her where she talks about um, the particular species being. Um, she says, in German ideology, Marx notes that for modern workers, there's a difference between their role or profession and their existence as individuals simply because of the fact that they cannot continue to do the same work for all of their lives. Competition and the lack of a means of income beside their own bodies force them to continually look for a new occupation. And it is mere chance as to where exactly they will end up working. The individual worker is therefore conscious that her personality does not coincide with her profession. This contrast with the members of feudal societies where individuals are only the specification of something universal 
namely their guild or estate. As Marx puts it in his uh, Grundrisse, individuals are imprisoned within a certain definition as feudal lords and vassal, landlord, and so on. Marx welcomes, she says, the fact that capitalism introduces personal individuality because human beings stop identifying with a specific social, uh, special, uh, social role or group, uh, quote, an, a limited human conglomerate, and are therefore able to identify with their humanity in general, their quality as a species being. The problem is that one lives their, this personality only in the private and non-political realm. Marx, therefore, she writes, demands the liberation of the individual from class individuality in all spheres of life. Human beings should be like private persons in their productive and political activities, too. That is to say, human beings should be well aware that none of their activities defines who they are. No one should have one exclusive sphere of activity. Everyone should fish, farm, and criticize without being a fisher, a farmer, or a critic. Everybody should participate in the organization of society in an equal manner and relate consciously to society as a whole in all their manifold activities. Now, um, I use this to, to think about the, what I call the universality of the Palestinian struggle should be understood in this context of um, what, if we extend or extrapolate from Marx on the idea of labor, should be understood in the context of the truth of the post-colonial subject, which, as Zizek provocatively argues, lies in its abstraction, incorporation into the global capitalist system, not in its concrete cultural content. Post-colonial critics, Zizek contends, assume that the truth of the post-colonial subject, living in a globalized world, as its cultural life world, tradition or way of life, Zizek refers to the Indian historian Dipesh Chakrabarti's example of the Indian software programmer who represents the truth of Indian life world through his concrete cultural content, such as rituals, etc. For Chakrabarti, this Indian programmer is a paradigmatic cipher of the unproblematic simultaneity or normalized coexistence of the universality of modernization and of particular life worlds. Zizek, however, correctly notes that, quote, postmodernity is not the overcoming of modernity, but its fulfillment. In the postmodern universe, pre-modern leftovers are no longer experienced as obstacles to be overcome by progress towards a fully secularized modernization, but as something to be unproblematically incorporated into the multicultural global universe. All traditions survive, but in a mediated, denaturalized form, that is, no longer as authentic ways of life, but as freely chosen lifestyles. In other words, within the totality of global capitalism, elements, as Zizek says, of pre-existing pre life worlds and economies, including money, are gradually re-articulated as its own moments, exapted, as he says, with a different function. I'm going to skip this point about uh, Marx's method and the Grundrisse because it, it, it sort of adds to this notion explaining exactly how this links to or the, the premises of, of Zizek's argument on the universality of the subject. And I want to take a moment um, or thinking about this through some of the recent debates that erupted in pa Palestinian circles around uh, after, in the aftermath of the March of Return and the whole d debate that erupted about the humanity of the Palestinians, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have another example, I don't know if I will have time to, uh, to talk about, um, a biography by the Palestinian journalist Ramondo Tawil, uh, Arafat's mother-in-law, uh, who wrote a book um, in the late 70s called My Home, My Prison, where she calls for mimetic identification of the Palestinians as the Jews of the Arab world. And I wanted to talk about the problem, like simply put in, in my analysis, uh, which is the whole issue of the universality of, of um, or the eminent uh, universal core of identity, is something put in simple terms, like some people call Edward Said the last Jewish, uh, Jewish intellectual. When many Jewish intellectuals like Arant and others try to distance themselves from, oh, distance themselves from Jewishness. 
So I don't, um, so this is what I really want to kind of see thinking about those identities in terms of that universal dimension rather than the particular content. Anyways, in, the, in that debate about the humanity of the Palestinians, I will just go straight to uh, the problem. You know, the debate about uh, framing Palestinian humanity and international human rights regime or other sort of frameworks, um, and then the shift to nonviolent resistance. Um, but what happened in that debate, they were met with denunciations of the dehumanization of Jews and Zionists by leftist circles on account of their purported anti-Semitism. The backlash came pretty quickly. In an op-ed for the Washington uh, Post, uh, Truaz executive director, Rabbi Jill Jacobs, apologized, apologizes for and defends the horrors of Israeli violence against Palestinians during the Great March of Return. Jacobs is clearly interested in the dehumanization Olympics, as I call it, in which the humanity of Jews and Zionists matters more than the Palestinians. She thus hypocritically implies that she is interested in a movement that requires caring about the dignity, well-being, concerns, and self-determination of all people. She does not acknowledge the humanity of the Palestinians in her piece, not even once. In the process, she co-opts a charge leveled against Palestinians in mainstream media to talk about the victimization of the Israelis who are allegedly blamed by leftists for their own deaths. But the real problem with Jacob's essay is that she opportunistically refers to the horrors of anti-Semitism and the dehumanization of the Jews, while conveniently ignoring the role Zionist anti-Semitism plays today in recycling and spreading anti-Semitic tropes and rhetoric. The Israeli and Zionist establishment has made allies with right-wing populist nationalists and white supremacist forces that have been known to spew anti-Semitic propaganda. Trump's recent infestation comments about immigrants reeks of noxious anti-Semitic Nazi language. The fiasco of the opening of the US embassy in Jerusalem speaks loud and clear about the complicity of the Israeli and Zionist establishment in the promotion of evangelical Christians anti-Semitic discourses that use the Jews as tools for the realization of their pre-millenary uh, dispensational prophecies. Moreover, the Zionist anti-Semitism has also targeted Jewish organizations that are critical of Israeli policies and Zionist politics. Um, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace uh, and other activists. Finally, as Zizak points out, in one of his pieces, the Israeli government's calls on European Jewry to immigrate to Israel is the wet dream of every European anti-Semite, for it helps realize their dream of a Europe free of Jews. Nonetheless, we should, uh, um, the, the basis, and this is where I wanted to use uh, Tawil, and I'll say it uh, quickly. Tawil tries to reconstruct Palestinian subjectivity through the elevation of this notion of victimization. We are all victims, which we see in this discourse about human rights. By calling the Palestinians the Jews of the um, Arab world, she, she applies the sort of mimetic ident identification to the Jews, elevating Jewishness to a pre-ontological status of victimization, something that Judith Butler herself criticized uh, Emmanuel Levinas uh, on. You know, Levinas basically considered Jewishness and even Israeliness to be all, always already, as Derrida would say, already a victim. So I'm not really uh, thinking that we are reframing Palestinian identity with this discourse. We are trying to um, substantiate the content of Palestinian identity as a victim in those ontological or pre-ontological terms does not work for me. And I feel that instead of giving people that discourse of humanity, I would rather radicalize the struggle the way that uh, Zizek says. Thank you very much. Thank you.